Our coach struggled up the hills, often overtaken by overcrowded local buses, and even once by this ox cart, though to be fair, we were stationary at the time. We'd flown direct from Heathrow to Bangalore, arriving at 4am, then in the bus to Mysore, where we're staying for three nights. There are 29 of us on the bus, plus our tour guide, Vijay, the driver, Viju, and the boy, Augustine, also called the conductor, whose most important function is to stop the traffic or die in the attempt whenever the bus needs to manoeuvre. Tipu Sultan, following his father Haider Ali, was all-powerful in this part of India, a soldier, scholar, rocket technologist, the devout Muslim ruler of a Hindu people, and a thorn in the side of the British for many years, until finally defeated in 1799. <laughs> We move on. It's a seven-hour journey, what with the comfort stops, photo stops, crossing the state border into Tamil Nadu, and the steep hills as we approach our destination, Uti. During the British Raj, South India was governed from Madras, now called Chennai, but the Madras summer was intolerably hot and humid for the British, so during that time they decamped the hills. Initially it was just the wives, but later the whole government. The Nilgiri Hills, where Uti is, was the chosen spot. The climate here is cool and refreshing, and the nights can be chilly. In the evening, a wood fire in your room if you ask, and hot water bottles in the bed every night.
The Uti Club is the gentleman's club preserved in aspect since the British left in 1947. Of course the membership is now Indian, but nothing else has changed. It's not on public view. But David Hogg was shown round it. He was presenting the club with a weighty book he'd written on the life of Sir Arthur Lawley, an eminence from the days of the British Raj and from Uti's heyday. And we were allowed to tag along, despite the fact that I was incorrectly dressed, wearing a shirt without a collar. After three nights in Uti, on the move again, a spectacular drive downhill, then on into the state of Kerala, until we reach the city and port of Kochi. His remains were returned to Portugal 15 years later. Off on our own, we take the ferry to Matancherry, a district of Kochi, once the centre of the spice trade. The ferry fare is two rupees, around three pence. For centuries, there was a strong Jewish community in Kochi. Most of them now left for Israel. This is the only surviving synagogue, with the congregation shrunk to ten. On from Kochi to Thekadi. Part of the journey is by bus, but part by boat through the Kerala backwaters. These are huge lagoons of brackish water just behind the coast.
Not a lot is happening, so I'll slip in some facts about Kerala, the state where we are. It's long had a communist government, and some clear advantages over other states, much higher literacy, less extremes of poverty and wealth. And while India is awash with litter, there's slightly less of it in Kerala. Along with a myriad of other tourists, we're in Thekadi for a wildlife spotting cruise on this reservoir. Verdict, nice views, but that's a wildlife pretty much a thumbs down. A walk in the forest might have been more interesting, and certainly better exercise. We didn't see a tiger, no surprise, very few are left in the wild. However, we did spot these children, or rather they spotted us, and were so engagingly eager to have their photograph taken. Today, back in the bus, and to the city of Madurai in the state of Tamil Nadu. Madurai has the holiest and by far the largest Hindu temple in South India.
Early this morning, after two nights in Madurai, we part from the bus, our driver and the boy, and fly to Chennai. Chennai is a big city, 5 million, with a traffic problem. It's hectic and chaotic, like all Indian cities, and in the summer, intensely hot and humid. Chennai is the capital of Tamil Nadu and, as Madras, it used to be the seat of British power in South India. Many very grand buildings survived from that time. we'd never have got past the armed guards and high security at Government House Gwindi. But after David Hogg had presented his book to the governor of Tamil Nadu, we were able to tag along on a guided tour of the grounds. These massive portraits, including one by Lawrence, were in the contemporary art building of the Government Museum Chennai. I left the grandest building to the last. David Hogg knew it existed, but our local guide in Chennai ignored it. The Lonely Planet didn't mention it, and a taxi driver couldn't find it. I walked there. An extraordinary place, cool, quiet, cared for, with a huge churchyard all litter-free and graffiti-free. You wouldn't find that at home. The Lonely Planet Guide, owned by the BBC, is dismissive of Chennai, summing up by saying, sites of any interest are uncooperatively thin on the ground, which, if said of the BBC, might be rather more true. After the South India tour, we fly, just the two of us, from Chennai to Colombo. We're met and driven to our hotel near Marawila, about an hour's drive.
The swimming pool is immensely attractive to crows. A pool attendant with a catapult spends every afternoon trying to deter them. The hotel grounds are swept incessantly and there are palm squirrels that keep us amused. But one huge drawback, we're warned against swimming in the sea on account of the dangerous undertow, and in any case the beach is covered in oil. To overcome disappointment about the sea, we quickly sign up for a three-day trip to Kandy and Euralia up in the Sri Lanka highlands. Some of the orphans are fully grown. Kandy is a sacred city for Buddhists and was the last capital of Sri Lankan kings. Euralia, as it's pronounced, was founded by the British in the 19th century as the ideal hill country retreat, and for recreations such as fox and, sad to say, elephant hunting. It's now the most important area for tea growing. From what we've seen of Sri Lanka, you'd never believe that there was a long-running civil war, only just now in remission. The people seem so relaxed and welcoming. Can the war really be over? If history tells you anything, it's not. Toddy tappers have a perilous job. At the top of a coconut palm, they collect the sap from coconut flowers moving from tree to tree on a lattice of ropes. The sap ferments naturally and turns into toddy, a sweet alcoholic drink. When distilled, it becomes arak and the active ingredient of cocktails at the hotel bar. Most of the catch is salted and laid out in the sun to dry. Along the coast where we are, people are predominantly Catholic, a legacy of Portuguese rule in the 16th century. The canal was built during Dutch rule, which ran from the mid-17th until the end of the 18th century.
last but not least, it turns out that the beach is not covered in oil, the black streaks are black sand, and the sea is not dangerous for swimming. The beach is steeply shelving, so there can be an undertow. Getting in, and especially out, can be a bit tricky, though how nice to have a challenge. Once in, the water is wonderfully warm, with no jellyfish, sharks or narses of any kind. Thank you.